All right. Today we are going to start getting into one of the more technical parts of this entire semester. Uh, the class is going to ebb and flow a little bit. There'll be some topics that certainly won't be easy, but if you put the time in, you can memorize them and get through it. There are other topics that if you don't get it early, it's going to come back to haunt you over and over and over again. Heart contraction is one of them. We are going to be making reference today back to material you learned in neuro. And even though I will uh, give us a brief recap of that relevant material here today, I'll also be posting another video of the neuro. So if you feel like you need that review, if you feel like you need that background, go ahead and feel free to watch that video. You won't get any questions uh, specifically about neuro on any of the exams or quizzes that you'll have, but you will need to understand that material so you can apply it to cardio. Today we're going to talk about cardiac muscle structurally and functionally and, and how it lends itself to the functions of the heart specifically. We're going to talk about innervation of the heart. You will see that the heart auto autorhythmicity. The heart has the ability to generate its own electrical impulses for a regular rate and rhythm of contraction. It doesn't need the brain to tell it to beat. However, the brain is still going to innervate the heart. It takes that automatic baseline rate, and then the brain can manipulate it. It can make it faster at times when we need more blood flow, and it can make it slower at other times when we don't. So we're going to use the autonomic nervous system to speed up or slow down heart rate as needed. And then finally, we'll take all that, we'll bring it together, and we'll look at the full cardiac cycle of the heart the anatomy, and the, the, the sequence of events that takes place for one complete heart contraction. So let's first talk about cardiac muscle. Difficult to really talk about cardiac muscle much without directly relating it back to the other types that we had, skeletal and smooth. And we can take smooth and kind of put it on the back burner for now. Let's just compare it to skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle generally speaking, has long, parallel running muscle cells. And when you look at origin versus insertion, those muscle cells will run the entire length of that organ. They are purely voluntary. You send a signal to that muscle, it's going to shorten the muscle. And every individual muscle cell in skeletal muscle needs a neuron telling it what to do. So based on those three characteristics, we can look at how it differs from cardiac. One, the arrangement of the fibers. Cardiac muscle is not long, parallel bands of fibers. They're short. They're connected end to end, and they branch. They form more of a network of muscle cells rather than these parallel tracks. And when you think about what its function is designed for, that should make sense. If we want our bicep to contract and lift something heavy in the hand, we want all those fibers pulling in the same direction and working together. For the muscles of the heart, it's a muscular sac. If you were given one of those icing cake decorating piping bags and you were given one squeeze, to get as much icing out as possible, or if I handed you a wet washcloth and I said squeeze it until you get all the water out, you would never only do that in one, you'd never pick up a damp washcloth and simply squeeze it. You would take that cloth and you would squeeze it and you would twist it and you would wring it out. With the piping bag, you would try and apply as many directions of force on that as possible to give that one force as much of a duration to eject icing from that bag. That's what we need from the heart. Long parallel muscle fibers won't give us that. A network of them will. So when we see the heart contract, we can picture the heart contracting from top to bottom, front to back, side to side, and even gives a little twist. 
We accomplish that because of the shape of the cardiac muscle fibers, the fact that they're branching to form this network. Secondly, they don't require independent innervation. Every, car, every skeletal muscle cell needed a neuron telling it what to do, not cardiac. At the junctions where one cell is adhered to another, you have two different types of connections. One is structural, called the intercalated disc. <clears throat> In lab, when you look at some microscope slides of cardiac muscle, you'll see muscle cell, muscle cell, and a nice dense line connecting the two. So that when those muscle cells pull, they stay in contact. Dense attachments. However, embedded in the intercalated discs are another type of muscular attachment that has nothing to do with strength. They're called gap junctions. Gap junctions are more functional. Picture that within these intercalated discs, there's tubes protein tubes. And what they allow for is exchange of intracellular material from one cardiac muscle cell with its neighbor. That spread of intracellular contents allows spread of muscle contraction. So if we contract this cardiac muscle cell, the gap junctions allow for this muscle cell to now contract. And then this muscle cell will contract and this muscle cell will contract so all we need in this mass of cardiac muscle cells is innervation at one point, and then we will see a spread of contraction go through the mass of tissue. So here we see our muscle cell membrane and see how, how it branches, quite a bit different than skeletal. Here would be an example of an intercalated disc attaching one cell to, the, to its neighbor end to end. And embedded in those intercalated discs would be these protein tube gap junctions. Now, when we studied the cell last semester, probably even back in middle school biology for some people, we talked about the membrane and all the organelles. What you studied then, we refer to as a generic cell. Mitochondria, ribosomes, smooth and, and rough endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes. And for the most part, those terms can translate over to most other cells when we talk about a certain type of a cell specifically. However, it's not uncommon that once we get to specific cells, some of those organelles may have modifications specific to what that cell is expected to do. Whenever we see part of the original generic cell have a special modification for a specific cell, we give it a new name. And we see some instances in the cardiac muscle cell where we have to give it a new name. In the generic cell, we call it the plasma membrane. Here we're going to call it the sarcolemma because the generic cell didn't have to deal with electrical impulses moving along its membrane. Any muscle cell does. Deep down in the cell, we don't have endoplasmic reticulum anymore. We have sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because in a muscle cell, the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium necessary for muscle contraction. And we get these extensions. And these didn't even appear on the generic cell at all. These are specifically for muscle cells. We get transverse tubules. Think about the transverse tubules as a pipeline that goes from the membrane down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, carrying the electrical signal. So an electrical signal goes along the sarcolemma down the transverse tubule, 
and releases calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then we can get muscle contraction. Any muscle contraction we see in the heart originates from one electrical point. We're going to call it the, the pacemaker of the heart. However, technically, we call it the sinoatrial node, the SA node. This is modified neural tissue. It's part of the heart, but it's modified neural tissue that develops a regular rate and rhythm of an electrical depolarization. Every time we get a depolarization, we see a spread of muscle contraction go through that heart. And it's because of the actions of that SA node <laughs> that we say that the heart exhibits an autorhythmicity. It develops its rate and rhythm automatically and independent of any external nervous structure. The SA node is going to be located mostly in the right upper, uh, right upper uh, uh, atrium. So if we look at a very generic diagram of the heart again, draw separations there, atriums versus ventricles. Our SA node resides somewhere around there. That's where everything originates from. That's where we get that automatic depolarization. We have an atrioventricular node. Now, as the name suggests, it should be right here, roughly at the junction between the atriums and the ventricles. We get an internodal tract running from the SA node to the AV node. We get another bundle of neural tissue that runs down through the interventricular foramen called the bundle of Hiss. And once it reaches the apex of the heart, here at the bottom, the bundle of Hiss branches. Now I'm going to draw these so that they're coming off the surface of the heart so you can see the branching. But keep in mind it's within the walls of, of, of the heart. But this bundle of Hiss is going to branch into what we call Purkinje fibers. So electrically speaking, this is an internal pathway for electrical activity to generate a full contractile cycle. We start at the SA node, it depolarizes, that signal is sent down through the internodal tract, through the AV node, down the bundle of Hiss, and through the Purkinje fibers. Now the question may already be in some of your minds, why do we need this? We just got done talking about the unique characteristics of cardiac muscle. And all we have to do is innervate one spot and we should be able to see that resulting contraction spread over the entire heart because of the gap junctions located in the intercalated discs. But remember what we talked about last time when we looked at heart anatomy. We don't want the entire heart contracting all at once. That's not going to give us efficient blood flow. We had our four chambers, atriums, ventricles, and what we want to do is receive blood at the atriums, move that blood into the ventricles, and then eject that blood out. So we want to see the blood moving in that one direction. We know that the ventricles are a lot more muscular than the atriums. So if we see the atriums and the ventricles contract at the same time, now they're fighting against each other. 
the stronger is always going to win and will have a very difficult time moving blood from the atriums into the ventricles while they're undergoing contraction. So what we want to do is separate those contractions. We want the atriums to contract, little pause, then we want the ventricles to contract moments later. We can't carry that out just with cardiac muscle tissue. Remember, one innervation and the whole thing wants to contract. So what do we do? We stick in the fibrous skeleton. Remember we had the fibrous skeleton sitting in that heart, roughly separating the atriums from the ventricles. So the fibrous skeleton kind of sits right along there as an electrical insulator. So any cardiac muscle contraction in the atriums doesn't spread automatically into the muscles of the ventricles because it would have to go through that connective tissue fibrous skeleton. So we put the fibrous skeleton in there to prevent the heart from contracting in one big mass. Then we get a modified way to work around the fibrous skeleton to still get the ventricles, the innervation that they need. That's where we get the ASA node, internodal tract, AV node, bundle fist, and percutia. That's where we get that whole pathway. We need that pathway to bypass and get around the fibrous skeleton. So now, when the SA node depolarizes, we get two things occur at the same time. One, atrial contraction, spreading all the way across the atriums, but not spreading into the ventricles because of the, the presence of the fibrous skeleton. At the same time that that's spreading across the atriums, we are getting a signal sent down the internodal tract. It relays through the AV node, down the bundle of His, and out the Purkinje fibers. Then we get our ventricles contract. The time it takes for that impulse to go through the internodal tract through the AV node, down the bundle of his, and up the Purkinje fibers, causes a lag. So by the time the ventricles start to contract, the atriums have already gone through their contraction. They're done now. And by using the fibrous skeleton combined with this neural pathway through the heart, we can get a nice, separate, and distinct contraction of the atriums Brief pause, then the ventricles. So we have one full contractile cycle. When we talk about one heartbeat, that's a full contractile cycle. SA node depolarizing, atriums contracting, then the ventricles contracting. Then we can start over again. And you see that in the notes on, I guess, what's obviously a much more sophisticated diagram. I still like using the very simple drawings, though. It helps get the impression across, then you can relate it back to the more technical diagrams after that. But you can see the yellow referencing our conduction anatomy. SA node, AV node, bundle of his, Purkinje fibers. The green shading is going to represent where we're seeing muscular contraction. So as soon as that SA node depolarizes, it's the atriums that immediately spring into action. That spread, however, doesn't flow to the ventricles automatically because of the insulating qualities of the fibrous skeleton. So the only way to get past the fibrous skeleton is to go down the bundle of his and use the Purkinje fibers. Then we get the ventricles contract from the bottom upward. But by the time they begin, the atriums are done, creating a nice separation of contraction. Last class, we talked about the valves of the heart. And you can see how this is snowballing already. This diagram shows the chronological order of the heart contracting, where 
the cardiac muscle is contracting. Across the top, we're seeing which valves are open and closed, which muscles are contracting, and which ones are relaxing. You are going to have to get an appreciation for all of this event happening at the same time. I've often described studying the heart as like studying layers of the same information. One contractile cycle, SA known, depolarizing and giving us one contractile cycle, atriums, ventricles, and you can look at that three quarters of a second of time in multiple different layers. You can look at the blood flow through the heart in that period of time. You can look at which muscles are contracting and which ones are relaxing during that period of time. You can look at which valves are opening and closing through that period of time. When we do blood pressure, you'll look at ventricular or chamber filling and pressure development throughout that period of time. Same period of time, but multiple layers of information occurring during that, that sequence. So now we get directly into neuro. So again, I'm going to do a brief overview of that today, <laughs> but I'll also be posting another video just from the neuro perspective. You do not need to study the neuro lecture as if you're going to be tested on it, but you will find it a lot easier if you know the neuro and simply adapt it to the cardio. If you don't know the neuro topic at all, you are not going to pick it up once we hit cardio. We are adapting what we already know to the system that we're in discussion with. So let's look at a couple of terms. And right now, this will already test whether or not you need to go back and look at the neuro topics. Resting membrane potential, greater potential, action potential. If you don't know what those terms mean, if you don't know what generates each of those, what channels open, which ions have to go across the membrane and in which direction, go back and look at the neuro. You have to. More general terms like depolarization versus repolarization. And again, the types of channels that we have present in those cells. You have to understand the neuro and adapt it to the cardio. So what we're getting at is how does the SA node function as a pacemaker? Look at the neurology of the SA node. What I'm going to draw here initially is going to be the what happens in a neuron. So forget the heart for a moment. This is a neuron. And for those of you that have been in my class before, You've already seen me draw this more times than you care to. Where we need to look is the ions. The term potential means voltage. Every cell has a voltage measured across its membrane. So if we were to look at a battery in the packaging on the shelf, we know that that battery has the ability to generate a voltage. And if we were to cut it in half, maybe when you were young, you were curious, and you got an old battery, you cut it in half, you could see that inside that battery there are chambers. Those chambers separate charges. So if we compare that to the cell now, where are the separation of charges? Well, outside the cell, we have a high concentration of sodium. We have a high concentration of chloride. And we have a high concentration of calcium. Inside the cell, we have a high concentration of potassium. And we have a high concentration of negatively charged amino acids. There's our relevant charges. <coughs> we have a sodium-potassium pump, 
which is going to be a main driving force for our separation of sodium and potassium. But this only just looks at as if the cell was in a package sitting on a shelf like a store battery. We know that that battery, as it sits there in the package, isn't developing anything. But if we take a piece of wire and we touch it from the positive pole of the battery to the negative pole of the battery, even without knowing anything about electronics, we envision something's running through that wire now. As we connect both terminals of the battery, we create a pathway for those separated charges to form a current. So we've got to understand how do we get a current here. All we have now is the separation of charges. In order for us to get an appreciation for that, let's get rid of some of these. We don't need all this right now. But simplify it. We're going to look at the movements of potassium. If you know how potassium is going to move here, you can take that information and extrapolate it to the other four. Potassium is at a high concentration inside the cell, low concentration outside the cell. Remember back to our principles of diffusion. If you've got a concentration gradient like that, what is going to happen? Potassium is going to want to diffuse outside the cell. It's going to move in this direction along its concentration gradient. Now, we know that with diffusion, if we let it keep going, we will reach an equilibrium. That won't happen here because, remember, we had our sodium-potassium pump always pumping in pota potassium. It pumps in potassium, it creates a very strong concentration gradient and a driving force for potassium to leave. So even though you're pumping it in, you're always working against any solute's desire to diffuse back in the opposite direction. So potassium is diffusing out. Here we have negative amino acids. Here we have positive charged potassium. What does opposing charges like to do with each other? They like to attract. So if we lose one potassium, we're going to leave behind one unpaired negative charge. If we lose two potassiums, we're going to leave behind two unpaired negative charges. Three potassiums, four, five, six. For every potassium we lose, we leave behind an unpaired negatively charged ion. Because of that attraction between positive and negative charges, eventually this ever so increasingly stronger negative charge is going to start taking the potassiums that had left by the fusion and pull them back in. You lose potassiums from the cell based on their concentration gradient, but they get sucked back in along the electrochemical gradient created with its opposing ion inside the cell. Now eventually, this works into an equilibrium. And the rate that we lose potassium is going to equal the rate that it's brought back in. But now, look at our battery analogy again. I said we, we pictured a current, a voltage developed when we touched a battery to its, the ends of, of, of the wire. Doesn't this look like a current now? That's what gives us a voltage across a cell membrane. Potassium gives us a little bit of a voltage. The movement of sodium that was out here in the opposite direction give it a little bit of a voltage. The chloride does the same thing. You have all five of those original ions fluxing back and across the membrane, each creating 
a voltage. You take all of those five and you, you average them out, so to speak, and you get the membrane potential of a cell. When we did neuro, we quickly got to a point where our terminology wasn't specific enough. Because we, if we took a chondroblast or an osteocyte, we could talk about those cells' membrane potential. End of story. But that term wasn't specific enough for neuro. Because neurons, and you'll see later on muscle, those are excitable cells. The voltage fluctuations are part of its function. So we need to have specific terms for each of those electrical fluctuations. So in a neuron, when everything is in a balance, in equilibrium, we don't simply call that membrane potential. We call it the resting membrane potential. That's going to be the membrane of a neuron when it's not being excited, when it's at rest. In a neuron, we had graded potentials caused by chemically gated channels. A chemically gated channel is a channel that opens or closes because of the presence of a chemical. So we get a chemical bind onto this channel, that channel opens, and it can let sodium in. And when we looked at a neuron allowing sodium to come in like that, We drew a diagram similar to this. Resting membrane potential. And we would see it depolarize as sodium entered that cell. That was a graded potential. If we hit a predetermined set point, then we could get an action potential. But a neuron had the ability to maintain resting until such a time that we opened up a chemically gated channel and allowed those ions to flow across the membrane faster than they originally could. The problem with our cells of the SA node is that we don't have resting membrane potential. It doesn't exist. In the cells of the SA node, you have a special type of channel that didn't exist in a neuron. It's called an HCN channel. hyperpolarization cyclic nucleotide channel, HCN. Now, HCN channels we're going to call leaky channels because that's exactly what they do. They're a channel embedded in that cell that causes the cell to leak. It leaks sodium into the cell. It allows sodium to drift across that cell membrane in the cells of the SA node, preventing you from ever achieving a resting membrane potential. And because of that, rather than have this sort of curve, 
this sort of change in voltage created by the opening and closing of a chemically gated channel. Now you get that deviation happen automatically. Because we love our specific terminology, even though this is still considered a graded potential, even when we're talking about the actions at the SA node, we more specifically now give it a term called a pacemaker potential. The pacemaker potential is the change in voltage from what would have, would have been resting, if we were talking about a neuro, what would have been resting membrane potential, about minus 70 millivolts, up to the threshold <laughs> of the voltage-gated channels, this is going to be strictly due to the presence of those HCN channels allowing sodium to leak across that membrane. And of course, as soon as we get our threshold of our voltage-gated channels hit, now we get our full action potential triggering the cardiac muscle cells in the atriums to shorten and contract and sending a signal down the internodal bundle to the AV node down the bundle of his through the Purkinje fibers and ultimately making the ventricles contract. So that's why we're never able to get a resting membrane potential in the cells of the AV node, SA node. The presence of the HCN channels prevent us from ever maintaining that equilibrium. So we go from what would have been considered resting membrane potential, and as soon as we get there, we automatically initially start creeping back up towards our threshold value hitting threshold and give us a full other contractile cycle start. We can't maintain resting membrane potential in the cells of the SA node because of the presence of these HCN channels. Now you'll see the numbers are a little bit different than what we used to quote in neuro. Over here on the board I had drawn neuro numbers, if you will minus 70 millivolt resting membrane potential, a minus 55 millivolt threshold value. I'll tell you the same thing now that I told you guys in neuro. I'm not overly concerned with the hardcore numbers. Make sure you know the pattern of voltage change. That's going to be more particular. Because in the cells of the SA node, we do see some slight variation. You know, minus 60 to approximately minus 40 millivolts this time. But the pattern remains the same. So the HCN channels give us that pacemaker potential that then gives us that reoccurring depolarization and reoccurring heart contractile cycle. Over and over and over again. We never stick around on what would have been resting in a neuron as soon as we hit that point, movement of sodium through the HCN channels already starts to depolarize the membrane. Another heart contraction. Another heart contraction. Over and over and over again. Now, it's also worth pointing out some other material that we did from AMP1. Muscle, the electrical activity in muscle. We didn't make a huge distinction back then between the action potentials in a neuron and the action potential seen in skeletal muscle because they looked rather similar. Again, the numbers can be different, but you know, if I cover that up and call it minus 70 millivolts, this looks an awful lot like <coughs> the action potential in a neuron, even though it's muscle, skeletal muscle. 
Here is what a maximum potential looks like in cardiac muscle. And what you'll notice is the repolarization phase is, is dragged out. You start to repolarize, but then you get this plateau phase. Once again, think about the adaptations of these muscle cells for what we need in the heart as opposed to a bicep. Again, if I gave you a, a damp washcloth to rinse out, ring out, you wouldn't give it a, a quick twist and be done with it. You would give a nice sustained force on that washcloth to provide the time it takes for the water to leave. Likewise, in the heart, what we don't want is a nice quick contraction of those chambers. We want a sustained contraction. That's what that plateau phase gives us. Increased calcium permeability across the wall of that cardiac muscle cell doesn't allow for a rapid repolarization. It drags that time out. So when you think about cardiac muscle contracting, it contracts and then it relaxes. So you get a bit of a sustained period of contraction. Here's what we would see if we compared the SA node electrical activity to the action potential in the atrial muscle compared to the action potential in the AV node and then the action potential in the ventricular muscle. Now this is also in time. Remember, we're looking at the same period of time from different perspectives. We get our pacemaker potential. There's where we start getting contraction. There's where our contractile cycle kicks off. The atriums are going to contract first. We got a plateau phase. At the same time, we're sending a signal down the internodal tract. Then the AV node is going to spike. By this point, the atrial contractions are just about done. By the time the ventricles start contracting, the atriums are long since done, and now the ventricles can contract. But if you look at the plateau phase in the ventricles compared to that of the atriums. Again, think about the adaptation. Atriums only have to move blood from the atriums to the ventricles. The ventricular wall has to generate enough muscular force to move that blood out to the entire systemic circuit. So it's going to need a stronger, more sustained contraction than we see in the atriums. So the exaggerated plateau phase should not be that surprising. Now, when we think about innervation of the heart, again, I can't stress this enough, the heart has an autorhythmicity. It causes its own heartbeat independent of any external nervous sources. But it is these external nervous sources that can manipulate that autorhythmicity. It can take the automatic rate and speed it up or it can slow it down. And what we're talking about here is the balance of the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic versus parasympathetic. If you recall when we did autonomic nerves in a and P1, sympathetic nerves came with the tagline of fight or flight. Parasympathetic nerves came with the tagline of rest and digest. So the sympathetic nerves amp the body up. Increased blood pressure, increased respiration rate. Pupils are dilating. GI uh, motility is going to go down. Urine production is going to go down. Heart rate is going to go up. Parasympathetics, everything is the opposite. Heart rate goes down. So you see the sympathetics and parasympathetics form this cardiac plexus both of which will innervate the SA node and modify how often it undergoes this automatic depolarization. When we discussed action potential before, and again, I apologize if I always have to say when you did this before, but it really is important here. 
Cardiac function that we're talking about today relies heavily on what you should have learned in neuro. You should recall somebody telling you that an action potential is an action potential is an action potential. There is no such thing as a big action potential or a small action potential. They're all the same. And because of that, when we look at a diagram like such, if this is a heartbeat, and this is a heartbeat, and this is a heartbeat, and we want to make the heart rate faster, but the action potential cannot be changed, really only gives us one option on what we can change, right? We can't change the time it takes to do a beat. What, <coughs> what we can change is the time in between the beats. We shorten that time, now we can get more beats per minute, we lengthen that time out, and we get fewer beats per minute. So when we say the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic, are speeding the heart rate up or slowing it down, what those nerves are doing is they're manipulating the length of time we spend during our pacemaker potential. If we want these two heartbeats to be closer in time to each other, we've got to take that pacemaker potential and make it depolarize quicker. Hit our threshold sooner, therefore giving us more beats per minute. If we want to slow the heart rate down, now we take that pacemaker potential and we spread it out. We decrease the slope of it. We put some lag time before we can get to the next action potential, therefore giving us fewer beats per minute. So if we put that on a chart like such, the normal one is at the top. Okay? The diagram I just had up here, this is that. That's your normal. Consider that your uninfluenced heartbeat based solely on the rate that the SA node depolarizes naturally. This is what we would see during sympathetic nervous system dominance, fight or flight. Now, there might be some optical illusion here. Maybe you're saying, well, the action potential looks different. We could take the yellow line and put it right over the blue line and it would be identical. Remember, the action potentials cannot be changed. They are what they are. All we're doing is changing our pacemaker potential. We are depolarizing quicker. We're going from the bottom, what would have been rest, up to the threshold value in a shorter period of time, which moves the beats a little closer together. Now, how we do that is by opening up more of the HCN channels. When we had our diagram drawn over there on the whiteboard of the neuron, and we put the HCN channel in there to make it an SA node cell, I still wanted you to think about the HCN channel as a chemically gated channel that we see in neurons. In a neuron, a chemically gated channel stays shut completely. Then when a particular chemical becomes present, then it opens. So a graded potential in a neuron caused by a chemically gated channel, that chemically gated channel was closed completely or it was open. Those were the options. An HCN channel still functions like a chemically gated channel, except it never closes all the way. It's leaky. So think about it still functioning like a chemically gated channel, but the fully closed option isn't there. It's either open a little bit. When you give it a chemical, now it opens a lot. But it's always open at least a little bit, giving it that leaky uh, description. So epinephrine or norepinephrine coming from those sympathetic nerves 
is going to produce cyclic AMP inside the SA node cells, which allows the HCN channel to open up wider. That HCN channel opens up wider, even more sodium comes through in the given amount of time. More ions fluxing across the membrane gives us a greater degree of voltage change. Now, in the time it took here to go from what would have been resting up the threshold, now with that increased flux of sodium coming across, we get that accomplished in shorter amounts of time. Decreasing the time in between each beat, allowing us to get a higher heart rate with more beats per minute. So to go from here to here, sympathetic nerves simply opened up the HCN channels more. Now, I like this diagram, but admittedly, it causes some problems. So I want to make sure we're looking at this appropriately. Looking at any diagram that goes in three steps like that, that's the way your eye wants to process the information. That's not how we're going to use the diagram. You went from resting heart rate to a higher heart rate. This implies a lower heart rate than the resting. So to go from here to here, we opened up HCN channels. But I don't want you going from here to here. Go from here back to here again first. When the parasympathetic nerves kick in, trying to slow that heart rate down, the first thing that happens is the HCN channels go back to normal. We get a normal pacemaker potential slope. Then we can talk about the effects of the parasympathetic nerves directly. The parasympathetic nerves open up more potassium channels. Remember, potassium was inside the cell. Remember, potassium was inside the cell. Sodium was outside. Sodium entering depolarized that membrane. Potassium leaving is going to have the opposite effect. So we had a shorter pacemaker potential when we allowed more sodium to come in. When the parasympathetics kick in, the HCN channels go back to normal, but now we start to see more potassium leave. Now, one positive ion, one positive ion. We never see potassium leaving at the same rates that sodium is entering. We still have a pacemaker potential. But now, for every potassium that leaves, it offsets the electrical change caused by a single potassium coming in. So let's, for argument's sake, put some numbers here. Let's say we're getting five sodiums a second coming into that cell. creating our normal resting pacemaker potential. When parasympathetics kick in and we open up potassium channels, maybe we're getting three potassiums leave. Those three potassiums leaving offsets three of the sodiums entering. So it's like we never had any potassiums leaving, but now we've only got two sodium's entering. I hope that analogy makes sense. But when we let the sodium influx go back to normal and then let more potassiums out, we counter the effects of those sodiums that were originally entering. Let's go back to the diagram. Let's go back to our diagram. Normal HCN function, increased HCN function, giving us a higher heart rate. If we want to make the heart rate lower again now, we let the HCN channels go back to normal. Then we open up potassium channels that will 
offset the effect of some of the sodiums coming into the normal HCN channel flow, giving us this dragged out pacemaker potential and a lower effective heart rate. It's acetylcholine from the parasympathetics that open up those potassium channels, offsetting the effects of some of the sodium that are still coming in through the HCN channel. So all we're doing is through the actions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, We're manipulating the pacemaker potential so that it reaches threshold in a shorter amount of time, giving us a higher heart rate, or a longer period of time, giving us a slower heart rate. And that entire sequence of events is going to be our cardiac cycle. Atriums, ventricles, done, started again. Now, we see a couple terms pop up that are going to be important for us to move into our next topic of blood pressure and cardiac output. And that is the concept of systole versus diastole. Systole refers to the contraction of a chamber. Diastole refers to the relaxation of a chamber. Now, not only with the muscle activity, but think about it in terms of pressure. If a ventricle contracts systole, it's also generating an increase in pressure, your systolic pressure. If you ever had your blood pressure measured, you know they come up with two numbers. Normally 120 over 80, systolic over diastolic. That's where these terms are coming from. They come from the term given to the contraction or relaxation of the cardiac muscle chamber. Four chambers, either of them, all of them have a systolic and a diastolic period. However, if you are just given these terms without any other clarification, assume we're talking about the ventricles. It's important to realize that systole and diastole are not instances. They are periods in time. Again, I can't say this often enough. We're dealing with the same period in time over and over and over again. Atriums, ventricles, atriums, ventricles, the time it takes for a cardiac cycle is the same period of time we've been talking about now for the last three hours or so. So not only to look at it like an instant, but a period in time. Is it a short period in time? Absolutely, but it's still a period in time. So when those ventricles relax, Picture the muscle beginning to relax, half relaxed, then fully relaxed. When it's first starting to relax, that's your early diastolic period. That's when the ventricles are just going to start getting blood entering into them. <clears throat> by the mid-diastolic period, the ventricles are now half full with blood. And by the late diastolic period, they're going to be filled with blood just before they contract again and enter into their systolic period. They begin to contract in their early systole. Mid-systole, they're, they're well into their contraction. Now blood is leaving the ventricles. And at the very end of the ventricles systolic period, the last little bits of blood are leaving the ventricles. Then the ventricles relax again. And we go round and round and round and round. So break that cardiac cycle up into a period in time and appreciate what's happened during any particular instant. It's important to look at it in this chronological sequence, mostly because we are going to pay particular attention to this late or this late diastolic period. How much blood we have in the ventricles during late distally is going to reflect on the strength of our ventricular contraction later on. The last couple of slides here 
or the next couple of slides, are really looking at that sequence of events in a little bit more detail than you can see through the camera. So please, like I've always encouraged, print out a copy of the notes. I know sometimes what you can see on the board through the camera isn't much detail. I try and do these recordings to mimic a classroom looking appearance as if you were sitting here in the front row. Likewise, if you were in class, there'd be times when you couldn't quite see what was written on the board and you'd have to refer to your notes. Same deal. But you can see by looking at that fibrous skeleton, the pairs of valves that are opening versus closing as blood's moving from the atriums to the ventricles and then subsequently outward. You will see EKGs, not so much in lecture, but in lab. In lab for sure. You will have to pick apart those EKGs. Now, some of the ones I have here for you are not really meant to be diagnostic here, but in lab, you're gonna to have to recognize those. What I wanna do is explain what an EKG is so that you can intuitively look at any changes and make sense of it. The first thing I want to tell you is that this is not what we had drawn on the board earlier. These aren't action potentials. What we had drawn earlier with respect to depolarization and repolarizing, that was electrical activity across a cell membrane. This is electrical activity through the heart as an organ. In lab, you'll hook yourself up with electrodes measuring overall electrical change in the heart. And you'll see that with increased activity, the heart rate will change. So what you're measuring here is electrical activity during the events of the contractile cycle. Picture that we really have four major events. Atrium's contracting, atrium's relaxing, ventricles contracting, ventricles relaxing. The first event was the atrium's contracting. That's your P wave. Your last event was the ventricles relaxing. That's your T wave. Forget about the fact that they both go in the same direction, even though one's contraction and one's relaxation. It's measuring a deflection of electrical activity. And we get deflections of electrical activity with muscle contracting and muscle relaxation. So atrium contracting, ventricles relaxing, relaxing. Here in the middle, we get this funky looking QRS complex. And it looks like that because remember, we have two events that are gonna be much overlapping in time. During this window in time, the atriums are relaxing while the ventricles are contracting. Those two different electrical events in opposite directions gives us our QRS complex. And by looking at this, you should be able to see what we have talked about so far with our chronological sequence of events. This would be the time from atriums contracting to ventricles contracting. So this would be the time it takes for that electrical signal to go down the SA node, through the AV node, through the bundle of His, and through the Purkinje fibers. This is the time necessary for one full contractile cycle. We should see this pattern over and over again because we see a repetitive contractile cycle over and over and over again. When we see irregularities, you can go back to what the EKG means and become the detective and decide where in that contractile cycle did we see the, the, the impedance. Maybe you have a rhythm that's faster than it should be. That's a tachycardia. In lab, you will look at the relationship between heart rate and the volume of blood moved. If the heart rate gets increased, the volume of blood moved with each beat dramatically gets less. 
Because remember, these are periods in time. If you increase the rate at which the ventricles are contracting, you cut this time down. Therefore, if we are relying on early diastole to end diastole for ventricular filling, and now we minimize that time, we're getting less blood enter the ventricles. Less blood enters the ventricles, less blood leaves the ventricles. So tachycardia is gonna to refer to an increase in heart rate. Bradycardia is the opposite. It's a slowing down. Now, these are more general terms, any number of causes, but that's what the term means, speeding up, slowing down. We can get a ventricular fibrillation. And you can see we lose a lot of our pattern here, because now rather than distinct ventricular contraction, we're seeing more of a flutter. We're seeing more of a contraction that's not really productive for the development of a blood pressure to move blood through the system. Atrial fibrillations are going to look different again. Remember, ventricular fibrillations are going to be absent of that atrial, uh, the SA node kicking off. The atrial SA node is where that contraction starts, <laughs> where the contractile cycle starts. So you may get an atrial depolarization that's not really significant enough to trigger the ventricular depolarizations. So you get these periods in time where nothing really happens. And as a result, giving you a very irregular heartbeat. We can have what's called heart blocks. Where you're getting an inability for the SA node to innervate the AV node and move that particular electrical activity into the ventricles to complete the cardiac cycle. And of course, there's a number of different ones along the way. And again, you will look at a lot of these and pick them apart in lab more so than here. But at least for here, I wanted to get into the normal EKG. And then by looking at the abnormal ones, you can at least go back and compare it to the normal and see generically where the problem may exist. We're certainly not looking for you guys to diagnose issues, but intuitively think about the abnormal EKG versus what's happening in the heart in the normal EKG and comparing the two. So heart anatomy, cardiac muscle, and the contractile cycle. Again, we're relying very heavily on what you should have learned in neuro. I'll be posting another video that is neuro. It's not cardio, it is neuro. So again, you're not gonna be asked neuro questions, but if you were completely in the weeds on what I talked about earlier, then you need to at least go back and refresh yourself on the neuro. You learn the neuro and you apply it to the cardio. That's how we're gonna be recommending that you do it. So if you have any questions, let me know. This is the first section that really starts to give students panic. The other topics we've talked about so far, while they may be new to you, and while they may still be challenging, they still give you the appreciation of, oh, if I just look at this a bit more, I'll get it. This is the first section that we've probably had so far where you've watched this lecture and you may have, have no idea what the heck I've been talking about. If that's the case, make sure you reach out so we can get more clarification. We'll have spotlight sessions that you can refer to, where myself and Dr. Davis are going to be handling those, handling some of these more difficult topics. I'll be doing two question and answer sessions per week, as laid out in the syllabus. Please feel free to drop into those, ask questions that you have, and if you can't make it to those, at least send me an email so we can get a one-on-one -on -one discussion online and uh, clear up anything you're having trouble with. So good luck with this. It certainly is the more challenging material that we've gotten into so far.
but with perseverance, we will get it taken care of. Good luck, and I will see you next time.